polluted in uh, solving several uh, problems. Uh, they dominate uh, negatively and positively our minds. It's very easy to understand and absorbed. Some arts can help us uh, to interact with events, uh, to react, to response, to make us feel angry. We can be directed by arts to have a positive uh, situation or attitude or sometimes negative and it can help audience uh, to face anything. However, losses of wars are very uh, huge. We might have losses in the infrastructure, in the warring countries and non-warring countries too. However, going back to the first step when it comes to culture and arts, there are there is integration among different civilizations. However, if we look at a different perspective, we would like we would see the similar similarity among different civilizations, a different approach. They are is integration in the approach dealt with the international crisis, family problems, and wars. All these are being presented in series, movies, arts, and drawing, even in musical pieces. Watching a film, for example, about a certain uh, war, you would see that there would be a kind of point of view. If there is a kind of humanitarian ideology in a different movie, you would see another movie that is dealing with the same ideology, for, however, from a, from a different perspective. And this leaves a dialogue in you, our mind. And then we have uh, those who... Uh, the, the, who, those who criticize what I'm trying to say here, whether these are watched in uh, drama, plays, movies, series, reading books, uh, poetry, photography, and all types of arts, all these types of arts are um, uh, ways and channels of expression of how we think and how we feel. We are here uh, to redraft our feelings. We don't want uh, to have more hatred that might reach, uh, take us to wars. We need to seek peace everywhere. That's why we need to be creative and be innovative and send different messages for peace. Very fast, I would like to introduce our speakers on the stage. First, uh, the well-known producer, writer, Mrs. Saad Yunus from Egypt. Uh, we have uh, the consulate uh, Mohammed Abu Abdullah from uh, uh, France. He is a cultural uh, uh, consultant. We have uh, the singer Nesma Mahgoub from Mos from Egypt. Sorry, and I'm very happy to have our last speaker, uh, the American actor. That's proof. Uh, she's an activist and designer, Rosario Tassel. Let's start directly, and I will ask my first question to Mrs. Saad Yunus. How uh, arts with all their types can face problems resulting from conflicts, wars, and a different extremism? The extremist uh, good evening, everyone. I bear a message of love from Sahib al Saada team to everyone in this room. In order to fight uh, hatred, uh, terrorism, and uh, all these things, first we need to know our enemy and what is the type of war we are taking, uh, in what age uh, and in what time we are facing a new war here. 
uh, we don't we don't ha we have are have facing a new and a different war. We don't have soldiers uh, here on the borders, but we have uh, corrupted people who are corrupting and destroying our uh, roots. Uh, the main thing here is uh, to be uh, uh, to take our identity from us. We have a group of people with a certain ideology uh, that. Uh, support this uh, and our land would, would be given to another people, to another group of people. What we want to do here is to regain our Egyptian identity that was missed best with for a long time. We have those destroyers uh, for a long time. How can we do this? Uh, first, we need to study the factors and the characteristics of our Egyptian identity. Now, I really speak about the Egyptian identity. What I I'm interested here is our uh, main pillar, our uh, dignity. This dignity that we recall uh, in order to regain our identity for long years, let's say starting the 80s, we have witnessed how this identity was taken gradually from us and how people were responding to this tide and how the values, our distinguished values are taken from us. I want to speak about my experience in, in the media. Uh, in order, no, I don't want to speak uh, theoretically. We want to apply this uh, practically. We need to uh, see how we participated in this. In Sahib al-Saada, we look for the Egyptian identity, the Egyptian character that is deeply rooted in our history, that has a reality that we live right now and has been there for 10 years and was eliminated, was being eliminated. We have several generations. We have a generation that have witnessed several ruling several presidency that have seen different wars and we have a middle generation that uh, is representing 50 percent of our population those who were born in the 80s a large percent of a percentage of which is uh, forming our population when I wanted to do Sahibat al-Sa'ada, I knew that I will be dealing with youth. Uh, uh, I had 150 young people. These are the uh, young people that are supporting me, that are uh, giving me inputs about this generation. We decided that this program would be dealing with uh, programs. Every CS uh, will be dealing with a certain topic, and this topic uh, might be uh, reviewed once more afterwards. Types of series, for example, uh, we have Made in Egypt, for example, under title Made in Egypt. This series, in this topic, uh, we wanted uh, to reintroduce our industries. Uh, these industri old industries uh, were introduced to the new generation that you know, knew nothing about. This needed uh, marketing, uh, trading, increasing uh, production lines, uh, pro providing good uh, products. Uh, we uh, have, uh, for example, we have a Bata factory, Qaha factory. These are traditional Egyptian industries. We think that uh, afterwards, if these industries were st are strengthened again, they are going to uh, represent a collection, a financial collection in our advertisement uh, so that uh, this will be equal to the funds coming from the Gulf area. Those Gulf citizens who decide to give money or stop money. So having local ad advertisers would support our work and would make us independent. 
And the, after the first series uh, was completed, uh, we uh, saw a lot of people sending several instant messages saying uh, that no goods, no commodities. People were rushing to buy. Demand, in fact, increases in that. And uh, this uh, was certified with papers. This gave us an indicator that people believe in us. We uh, uh, put a goal that any statements uh, directed or instructions given are usually uh, resisted by people. So we are not giving demands. We are not giving instructions. We knew that our plan is a long-term plan. We had increased loyalty after three years. People started to have a loyalty for this program. Why? Because it expresses what we feel as people. We are not there to say slogans. We are not just directing people. And uh, it gives us uh, the feeling that we are all sitting in the, it gives people the feeling that we are all sitting in the same room and uh, speaking about an interested top uh, topic. Second, the fashion. We had a series about uh, fashion that would help people uh, to go back uh, to the beauty, to the designs, to the fashion, uh, cleanliness. And then we had the eagles of the uh, sky. We had several generals, and uh, we were keen uh, to have people who have a sense of entertainment, who are able to tell their stories simply. We included in this series a group of generals and military leaders who gained, uh, who won in 1973. Uh, and we also invited a young woman uh, from uh, uh, the youth who are uh, who is a captain, an airplane captain. This series was repeated four times, and we had 15 million uh, uh, wa people who watched, 15 million people who watched this uh, in that fourth time. Then we had musical uh, projects. In musical projects, we decided uh, to uh, regain, uh, re have rebirth uh, for the musical works done uh, for more than 110 years. We dealt with the theater, with the movies, with the cinema, and uh, some very famous uh, artists. We uh, we looked for the musical uh, piece of pieces of work, and we uh, played it with Egyptian uh, using Egyptian orchestra. We have very famous people here, and we work jointly with the Arts Academy. We have three of the most known uh, conductors, like Dadar El Abbasi. George and Mohammed Osman. And uh, our goal is uh, to uh, train our ears uh, to uh, listen to this music, uh, the production, this, these were, uh, musical, uh, musical pieces were uh, declared or broadcasted on different media. We re and there was a kind of cooperation between the two generations, the new generation and the uh, previous generation. In fact, I was astonished that the new generation did not know uh, uh, the introductory music, uh, musical piece of uh, Rafat al-Haggan series. 
Also, we did something that is called Cinema Club, already is cinema, and we uh, brought all the movies that were presented in that program, TV program, and we called for uh, presenting all these new movies that were presented in Cinema Club. Nisma did a great job in this, the, present, the introduction of uh, and the opening of these uh, movies were presented. What we wanted to say is that uh, our people is very uh, enlightened, and because our citizens, our citizens used to memorize all these songs in different languages, uh, and the uh, the. Past generation uh, remembered that this music was heard by many people and was uh, loved by many people. We had also another series that is called Asiad Masr or uh, Egyptian leaders, and we draw, we dealt with uh, very simple jobs like uh, garbage collectors. Uh, uh, people like this. What we wanted to say is that we need to respect each other, whatever the type of job anyone does. And when we sat with them, they became stars, and they received uh, several uh, Authors uh, from different uh, places, and we had also another series with uh, that is called Hadrat El Askari. We dealt with the Central Police Department. We dealt with the officers in the Central Police Department. We uh, dealt with those as human. What I really wanted to say here that this is the method that we use. This is the approach that we used in order to revive our culture. We have uh, 260 years. However, I feel that we haven't started yet. I think that's enough. That's too many. Um, now I am uh, going to uh, pose a question to Mr. Marwan. How music or uh, art can be used in all its kinds uh, as a weapon to face wars, conflicts, and extremism? لقد تقدمت للعمل في المجال الفني منذ سن الخمس سنوات في تونس و at some stage in my life, I knew that art is going to meet me or find me somewhere, or am I going to find it later? And um, I always like um, felt like the stage is really the place where people have the freedom. People have the opportunity to talk um, without the fear of being judged, of being misunderstood. And uh, lately, and uh, when I moved to Germany six years ago, um, I started working with refugees um, in, uh, in a theater that offer the opportunity to uh, people from around the world, whether they are refugees, asylum seekers, or international um, immigrants, to um, have the opportunity to uh, participate in workshops, lectures, and uh, performances, regardless of their mother tongue language. So, um, as a cultural uh, consultant, we designed like this uh, project called A Stage for Everyone, where people um, feel included. Because um, I remember myself when I moved to Germany at the beginning, um, as an Arab and um, Mediterranean person, um, it was hard because you have to deal with a new society, a new culture, new language, and it's always a barrier because, of course, language is very important uh, when it comes to integration. And um, so I kind of developed that empathy for people who are moving from a country to a country. But of course, when you're a refugee or as an seeker, um, 
you need some time and some kind of a platform that offers you the opportunity to express yourself. And um, many of the refugees I worked with, um, they kept telling their stories again and again because for administrative reasons, um, sometimes you have to kind of um, document what you've been through to proceed your procedures and it makes things more um, complicated for them because not necessarily every person wants to talk about what he's been through. We all have like stories that we don't want to talk about and um, uh, people are still in a post-traumatic uh, context. So art in this context, what we've been designing is uh, a project that kind of offers the people a safe place and where they don't even think about uh, any kind of racism, any kind of xenophobia, any kind of um, rejection. And because um, I, re I remember like when I just moved to Germany and I found this theater group and it kind of helped me to overcome this um, uh, integration obstacles, let's say. And um, it's really um, amazing how um, performances like um, uh, arts and um, and the stage, whether theater, um, body expression, and all that, um, people get connected to each other much, much faster than when they're meeting in another context. Mm. They feel the trust within the group. They develop some kind of um, connection. Uh, they feel understood. And that's how um, arts in this context kind of um, uh, worked as a kind of a cure, let's say. And um, Indirectly, there is a kind of um, a process going on that people, at the same time, are not only learning to trust others, other people again, and build up a new uh, social context, but they're also having a different possibilities to express uh, what they've been living, what, what they've been through, um, and in all this situation that is going on in Europe right now, so it's, it's a very difficult context, let's say. And um, I've been working on this project since two years now, and um, I have found out that this is really what people need to talk about more. Like, we should not only think about offering a, a job, an alternative for these new people, because they're part of us. This is their new country. Yes. And they're asking uh, just to belong to a new society. And when we tend our arm to these new people, uh, we need to uh, just have in mind that we are all humans at the end. And um, that has been through a lot. And exactly. Okay. So um, people can connect. trying to find a safe zone in a way. So I have this story at the beginning trying to uh, open up to others. Because I feel in some sense that there is a lot of We don't force people to speak. We don't force people to act. We just give them the... The tools. Uh, the tools, exactly, to... Um, communicate with each other, to have the space, especially to, um, to find out what they really want as well. Because in this transitional time, it's, as I said, it's very complicated because they have to go through these administrative procedures and all that. And um, we also offered for this project a multilingualism um, aspect that kind of let people feel that it doesn't matter what your mother tongue language is. And this is something that is very related to art as well, because nowadays, in the globalization context, um, one language is not enough. Two languages are not enough. I grew up, I mean, in Tunisia, we're uh, very famous for being bilingual, Arabic and French and English. So, um, and I've been meeting people from all around the world speaking four or five languages, and nowadays we feel like 
we not only learn languages to uh, to know about what is going on in the world, but also to also to connect in different levels, from an artistic levels. A lot of projects are going on through between countries, through corporations. Um, artists are meeting each other from different countries, and uh, the result of this combination of cultures and uh, and art is something beautiful to see. Of course, because everybody having an authentic, authentic touch of a story to tell. Everybody have uh, an individuality in what he has to say and how he wants to say it. And uh, I think art in this context is really the best gift that people can offer to a newcomer. Yes. Well, thank you for that. It's very thank insightful. You. Mr. Mohammed. thank you. Mr. Mohammed, we were talking uh, before we started our session, and I know you have a very interesting uh, point of view of the same uh, subject, so if you would please uh, tell us as well what you think. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for welcoming me uh, here. I'm very uh, happy to be there. Um, I have, um, my experience is both as a diplomat, a career diplomat, in, uh, specialized in conflict resolution, I worked uh, several years for the uh, United Nations Security Council, and today in Egypt, for a year, I have been the cultural counselor and the director of the French Institute in Egypt. So I can see uh, this topic from uh, both ends, from the diplomatic and conflict resolution end, and also from the uh, cultural and artistic field. Um, for me, uh, today's session is kind of a paradox, because today, uh, more and more conflicts in, in the world are about identity, are about culture, are about religion. Art has been used for years now uh, as a propaganda. And uh, when you go and see an artist and try to use him uh, to, to do something uh, about uh, a political question, uh, some of them will be interested, but most of them will tell you we, are, we don't want to be involved into politics, we yeah. prefer to be artists only. I mean, not all of them, but some, some of, them. of them. So we have this paradox. So, but yet, I do believe that uh, art and culture can play a role, a decisive role, in uh, conflict resolution, in conflict prevention, because art and culture is as vital as breathing air, uh, as individual, but also as society. And that's the key point. So from my point of view, uh, I believe that art and culture can play a triple role uh, in, uh, in conflicts. The first one is to, uh, as, uh, to prevent conflicts. Uh, it's uh, about, um, I mean, uh, um, showing, as you said uh, just uh, a minute ago, uh, to show that we are different, that we can uh, live together with our differences, etc., that we can dialogue. It's also a way uh, between countries that do not have official contacts, no diplomatic contacts, to maintain some sort of uh, dialogue through artists or through uh, sportsmen. We have seen that uh, uh, du uh, during history. Mm -hmm. And finally, to raise awareness. To raise awareness that something is going wrong and that maybe we should do something uh, in order to avoid the conflict. And uh, we have seen that, for example, uh, 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 between the two world wars with uh, Brecht in theater, raising awareness about uh, what was going on with the Nazi regime. The second thing that art can do is to be, uh, once violence has broken out, is um, to uh, be a tool of catharsis for the people. I mean, for the individuals, it's an opportunity for the victims to speak out, to scream. Uh, it's also, um, on the other side, it's a way of uh, uh, moderate the violence, to make it more bearable, because you can transcend the violence into art, into culture. So it makes it for the individuals and for the, for, for the society as a whole, uh, it makes it more bearable, more livable. And also, it's, um, the third thing is an art to repair after, after the crisis, after the violence has erupted. Because art, and that's the key point, it changes perception. Mm -hmm. Not only perception of me, of the other, but of me on me. Okay. It's about self-perception. Okay. It's about perception of the other and self-perception. And when you have a conflict, be it a, a conflict in your family or a conflict between two countries, what is at stake is 
hatred, anger, the enemy, the others. So you have to change the perception of the other as the enemy. Or, but you also have to change the perception of yourself. Oh. Because during a conflict, you, are, uh, you, you feel shame, you feel guilty, you feel anger against yourself. And so if you want to reconcile, you need to change the perception of yourself, of your self-esteem. So, and you know, culture at the end, it shows that it's not binary, it's not black or white, it's uh, I mean, 50 shades of gray, 50 shades of violence, you know? Yeah. So yes, and that would be my conclusion because I don't want to be too long. So yes, and I will finish by a paradox again. So yes, art and culture can play a decisive role in conflicts, but I will start with, I will uh, give four recommendations and it will be four no. The first one, it's no shortcut. Art and culture can play a role, but it's in, in the long term, because as I said, it's about perceptions. And perceptions can only be changed over a long period of time. Uh, second, art is not about answers, it's about questions. So don't give an assignment to art and culture. Just give the opportunity to artists and the cultural world to raise questions. <laughs> Third, it's, there is no silver bullet. I mean, if you have uh, the conditions for art and creativity and culture between countries or between people inside a country, and, but if you don't fix the political, the economical conditions, etc., you won't achieve anything. So it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And finally, there is no blueprint. So if you ask me, uh, what should we do after this session? I have no answer. My only answer is that uh, so there is no blueprint, no model, no uh, uh, road to go there. What you have to do is to create opportunity, to accept variety, to, to accept differences. And there is no such thing as official art. So, and that would be uh, my final word. What we do uh, as the uh, French Cultural Center, what we do is to try to create opportunities for artists, both Egyptian and French. We uh, try to create uh, ways of exchanging so that they can meet uh, Egyptian going to France or French coming to Egypt. And finally, uh, we try to do it from scratch. So we start early through education and language, uh, French speaking uh, mm -hmm. class, etc., to uh, older people, artists, or even people who are not engaged in artistic life but who, who want to be uh, part of this. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what I wanted to say today. And thank you again well, for the Well, thank you very much. You covered it. We will be talking more about the different uh, educational programs that can, be, that can be done using arts. Rosario, I see that you were listening to Mr. Mohamed. You were agreeing a lot. And I want to, or that's what I felt. I want to ask you a question. Do you think the media is using art in the right way to direct people in the what, what it should be doing, really, which is spread love and peace and to use it as a weapon to fight against anything horrible, more or less, like terrorism, like wars. Yeah? Do you think the media is? like when? Because we were just talking right now, and Ms. Uh, Ms. she has a show, and it's a huge platform that she's using to spread... Um, more awareness about arts to, the, to people. So do you think the media right now is doing it the right way or do you think it needs a little bit more? I'm not fully sure that I understand what that question right. means, if the media is doing it. I don't think that that's necessarily we've got, the we've media's got, role. We've got all types of arts. We've got people that can uh, sing, you can express through music. You've got people that can, do, uh, that can draw through art. You've got people that can do that. Do you think the media is directing it in the right way? Like, do you think... All right, let me rephrase completely. Let's start from the beginning. What, what, what do you think so far is, uh, from your point of view, what do you think, how, how are we using art to fight terrorism, to fight wars? How do you think, it's basically the same question I was asking everyone. Um, What's your point of view, though? Well, one, I think art is um, really significant and really important in the making of it, in the participating of it. Um, it actually helps to, for people who are suffering from, when you're talking about terrorism and war, you're talking about people who are suffering from PTSD, they're coming from spaces and places where sometimes, say in Saudi Arabia, where you know it's mostly women who are the psychiatrists, and so there's a stigma against going to women and asking for help, so you're not getting that access point of communicating and doing that self-care that is really necessary 
to evolve, so that's why art can be so in incredibly instructive in the actual making of it, because it builds new pathways and shows other options. And you know, when you're having to sit there and have this blank piece of paper and create something, you're forcing your brain to come up with solutions, to make something. Um, and you know, so it, it belies the sort of um, stresses that kind of created certain pathways in the brain that make you only react angrily or make you only react in fear. Um, so the making of it kind of helps us to kind of attach to what our universal needs are um, of self-care, of love, and, you know, doing all of that stuff. As you said, it's, it's doing that self-work um, and figuring that out. But it's also um, when you're watching it, you know, you get the same thing of, you know, there's no movie theaters in Saudi Arabia, but they're going to be starting, you know, opening up one in a year. So they might not be able to watch movies, but they have commercials and they have other things that they're able to watch. And just being able to watch a commercial where you see a father give the car keys to his daughter is so incredibly significant. And just the visuals of that can be really transformative and kind of push certain boundaries that sometimes you can't have. I mean, the first language, everything that we had came from hieroglyphics. It came from pictures. It came from imagery. It's something that becomes very universal. Um, and when you start pushing past into what we're going into now with 360 and VR and AR, you start to see what our possibilities are of actually being in a refugee camp, of actually experiencing something viscerally, which sometimes you can't communicate. Maybe you don't know that Muslim person or you don't know that woman in power, but because you've been able to experience them in a film and got to connect to them and see them be hungry, see them be scared, see them be angry, see them care for their children, see them want a better future for themselves and their community, you suddenly have a way of connecting to them and recognizing that again, we are part of the human race and that we have our human dilemmas. And so it kind of crosses cultures and it crosses, crosses these different boundaries and that's just tremendously important. The value of recording things and being able to show it in the future is what's created this leaderful moment that we're in where we don't necessarily need a new Martin Luther King because we're able to go and watch the videos of him. Mm -hmm. And so it's inspiring an entire generation that has grown up with the idea of tolerance that is now pushing past tolerance and is actually moving into acceptance and going that I don't need to tolerate you, I don't need to kind of be okay with what you are. I absolutely accept it because I accept myself mm -hmm. and I want you to accept me as well. And so I'm recognizing that this is the conversation around activism. So when you're talking, I th that's why when you were saying something about the media, is the media doing it right? Well, in that sense, um, you know, and it's great to have dialogue and you're seeing how necessarily important that is to just be here and creating these spaces where people can network and they can communicate with each other across generations because there's young people here, there's people who are experts in their fields. That's so tremendously important. But when you step out of this space, are, are we the exceptions to the rule because we got the access to this space, because we have access to the media that shows it? You know, are we really kind of saying it's really important to be watching a film made by women, it's really important to be supporting those films and actually funding them, it's really important to actually have a space for it that is seen. So you have people like Louis C.K. who's going, okay, there's a film called Check-In about gangs in D.C. who are gay and they're learning through art and he, he's older white comedian, but he's going, I saw this film and it opened my mind to a community that I knew nothing about otherwise, and I'm going to promote it. You have a film like The Square that talks about the revolution here, but it's not shown here because it's censored. Um, you know, so where is, how far does a dialogue get to go and how much are we really, you know, if that, if you're talking about an action that comes out of this, are we, are those the things that we're going to start to push? Because we recognize when you watch a film, you know, you can have something like a Bond movie talk about the privatization of water and quantum of solace. That is not a normal bad guy in a movie, but suddenly the privatization of water, which is a tremendous issue in marginalized communities around the world is in a Bond film. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, you know, how art can change. You know, the, the documentary Josh Oppenheimer did in, in, in Indonesia where the ethnic cleansing that was going on killed so many people was supported by the government and he, he went into these communities and took these gang members who were the ones who had killed all of these people and they wanted to reenact what they had done. So they started, they, he's, this is a movie about these gangs filming the scenes of what they had gone through and it was all these years later of actually starting to reenact the crimes that they had done that made them actually recognize them as crimes. 
because right. suddenly, you know, they're like, yeah, so I would take this guy up here and I would put something around his neck and I would choke him out. And then you'd see him start to act it out and he thought it was cool because it was like a gangster film. And, but the second it actually went around his throat, he was like, he started freaking out because he recognized what he'd actually did to people. So the action of all of this, this, the exposure that we get, you know, because, you know, you're sitting and you're watching a movie, you're not just going, you have access to this education because you're a male, or you have access to this language, or through nepotism, you have access to this job. You're putting this movie out that's talking about, you know, um, women in leadership or, or people of color being able to be very intelligent and capable. And so suddenly you're able to have, you know, the pathway to someone like Barack Obama becoming president wasn't just his own personal career. It was the multitude of TV shows that came before it that helped to push against our culture that said a person of color couldn't achieve anything. And that kind of allowed the, a possibility even for people who didn't have neighbors who looked like him to kind of at least listen to him. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's a really powerful um, tool to be able to see yourself on screen and be able to see ideas that otherwise you might not be exposed to. So when you're watching something and going, you know, I, I talked to someone earlier who works in infectious diseases and is trying to work on having, um, bringing down the, the, the time rate between finding out what kind of bacteria because we're, he's working on superbugs. So, you know, we're becoming more and more and more resistant to um, different kinds of antidotes against bacteria and things and plagues. And, we're, and you know, and, and uh, he's going, we have to narrow that time down. A movie that really moved him was Contagion. You know, I watched Medicine Man and I remembered watching that as a kid. And it's just a silly romance movie. It's Sean Connery. But I remember going, we can't tear down the rainforest because maybe the cure to cancer might be in, a, in an insect that we're going to tear down, that we're going to tear down its home in these trees. You know, so you end up having, you know, this equalizer in film and television and commercials where rather than just having that access point because of the person that you know or because you're male or because, you know, you have this job, you're just sitting there as a kid watching this movie and suddenly being exposed to an idea that makes you think, oh, I want to be a pilot. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be the person who creates this cure. I want these different things. And that's why censorship and all these things is really actually quite detrimental to us because some of that first dialogue that actually happens is in that exposure to different ideas and not ideas that you were just perfectly getting disseminated through your education, through your family, through your friends, through your community, because that's still really isolated from what the global conversation is. And we are a global world specifically because we're utilizing all of the technologies around us to talk about our past past and explore that past to, to promote what the future could look like. We had tablets on screen before we had tablets in real life. Yeah. You know, as we're starting to get into AI and we're starting to look at what that could possibly mean, is that a good thing that there's a Saudi Arabian robot while we're also criminalizing human beings who are refugees and climate refugees? You know, like, and it starts those dialogues before it even happens so that we can be prepared for what's coming. So... I don't know necessarily, to kind of, you know, to talk about what media, I don't know necessarily they're always doing it the right way. I don't think that there is necessarily a right way. I think it just, we just need to be able to continue to push for access for everyone, mm. to be able to have um, the opportunity to challenge and have a dialogue. Because as you're saying, there is no one right answer. But having as many people being exposed to as much information as possible, and not in a way where it is censored or it's, or it's um, curtailed, because... Um, what you end up having, having then is these sort of isolated chambers, which creates a lot of problems and frictions and terrorist groups and stuff like that. Um, what you end up having is people who were starved of information now drowning in it. When you give people access points, they start coming up with solutions. And, and, um, and that's what we really need, is, is to continue to make sure that across boundaries, across cultures, across language, we're showing each other the imagery that comes from our heart that actually transforms our brains um, and creates a future that we all want to live into. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, very. It was very insightful. Thank you. So the power, the power of art is just huge. It's way beyond us before we even realize. All right, well, Nisma, I will tell you about it. شفت لك حاجات كثيرة إن أنت بتغني في لغات تانية بلغات تانية غير العربي هل أنت أنت شايفة ده 
ايه البوينت ايه وجهه نظرك ان انت لازم تعملي كده او شايفه ان ده لازم يتعمل آه مبدئيا مساء الخير عليكم جميعا وبشكركم مره تانية وان انا موجوده هنا النهارده وان انا جزء من المناقشه دي ومن المؤتمر ده انا عموما يعني قبل قبل ما However, uh, before uh, starting uh, to think of languages and what they added to me personally and to the society in general uh, I liked this uh, since I was young, in fact, and when I grew up, I, I understood many things. I understood my country, our economic, uh, artistic, uh, musical, uh, social uh, conditions. I felt that uh, it's uh, out of being very proud uh, to look at it. We know, we always tell ourselves, unfortunately, that they knew better than us, that uh, they have the information. We are capable of going abroad and prove ourselves. And we can prove ourselves also in our country. It's not only about going out of our countries and prove ourselves outside. It's not about our energies being, being revealed outside. No, inside our country we can also reveal ourselves we can be affected by all the factors of our, our, uh, us us. I feel that uh, languages are bringing us uh, to closer being uh, in a, a youth conference uh, uh, and every uh, I think in this uh, be, being in this conference even uh, and being together in this room with at least two or three languages uh, in the room uh, all these things are helping us to get closer uh, to have a middle ground. I think that if we want to know a certain country or see a certain people, you need to have a look at their art. And specifically, if we think or talk about Egypt, I think that there's a kind of orientation or direction to art. And I think that this uh, might help our country, if we are watching uh, Egyptian art, uh, I would uh, recommend or encourage people to watch the beautiful Egypt. Uh, those, this, these concerts, this places uh, with civilization, with art, with education, all these beautiful things, uh, all these optimistic things uh, and positive things. And uh, maybe if we uh, speak about the most effective uh, uh, arts in Egypt, which is uh, the, the TV, the, the cinema, movies, with my due respect uh, to all types of arts, but these are the most producing. Watching uh, uh, songs, for example, or maybe the movies, if we see the movies, uh, the, the, unfortunately, the majority of our movies are speaking about uh, only revolution, only slums and on former settlements. Yes, this is right, uh, but we need the movies to be reflecting all levels or classes of the society. But it's, unf it's not good uh, to uh, look uh, at at our life from one perspective. Sometimes we as Egyptians ask ourselves, is this is the only thing in Egypt? No. Uh, as tourists, when they come to Egypt, they don't feel safe. Why? Because all what they see on TV is the violence. They are afraid of watching, of walking in the streets. However, we can walk in the streets, and violence can be everywhere in the world. Thieves are everywhere in the world, and these this are incidents that might take place uh, in uh, the greatest uh, countries, even. So. I want to ask who is doing this and who is saying that this is commercial, who is making this decision, who is the decision maker in this, who is saying that these type of movies are the commercial ones. So people start like producing similar ones because these are the movies that are liked, mostly liked by the audience. and. 
if they find the other thing with a nice message and a good lesson, they won't see it. No, they will see it. People want to see the nice things. Unfortunately, the majority of uh, works done in movies are for pro are talking about problems only they don't even talk about the solutions of these problems we need this optimistic look so instead of presenting uh, such types of uh, arts it's better to uh, present the optimistic view i think that this is uh, the only uh, way to change this Uh, speaking about uh, movies uh, or cinema production, we are speaking about an industry without a shield. Uh, unfortunately, it's hap it, w it works haphazardly, um, simultaneously, without any control. Second, uh, the movie is the production that is presented in different uh, presentation or in different cinemas and is closely linked to the uh, ticket. Unfortunately, uh, uh, it should have an income, but it is being uh, stolen from the first two hours of presentation in the cinema. Producers are reluctant from producing such films or movies because there is no return. This type of industry is based on love. What we have now is having a few uh, producers who are able to produce or present some movies that might have for some financial returns. In order to hold accountable this type of ins industry, we need to give it first all types of support. We need to know first that it is a pyramid shape. It is based on a pyramid based. We have a base. A base uh, means that we have a majority of audience. This type of audience are the ones who are interested in going to the movie, uh, to go to the cinema, pay for the ticket and not download it from uh, illegally uh, from the uh, internet or something who is interested of, of going to the movie. And then we have the middle class who are trying to uh, watch uh, entertain, entertaining uh, movies. And then we have the peak or the top of the pyramid. Uh, and this, is, these, uh, has, this has to do with documentary movies. And usually these documentary movies are financially supported by the government or the state. So it is not controlled. The industry is not controlled. When we uh, uh, criticize this, unfortunately, this producer is dealing with the majority of audience who has a certain culture. If And unfortunately, when we say that this is not good, usually people go to buy it. So this type of producer is dealing with this uh, this group of people. For example, Ahmed Adawiya, uh, when he first started to sing, people were against him and uh, was seen as a very bad type of art. And he had a very uh, strong resistance at that time. But now he's different. The idea here here, the idea here is to keep producing, to keep producing. Maybe you produce a type of movie that, that Nisma likes, but the majority of people won't like. Maybe people do not are not interested in poetry, but they are interested in simple things, in simple poems, uh, very uh, popular ones so we don't have 
it's an industry in the market. Unfortunately, it's hacked. Uh, we don't have uh, this culture of uh, uh, making this forbidden or feeling that it should be forbidden to steal movies from the internet. This is unfortunately so. The industry is uncontrolled. If we go back a couple of steps uh, and uh, we speak about uh, the uh, black and white movies, and um, I, I think that the majority of movies at that time had uh, pashas and uh, uh, nice dresses, uh, very beautiful ladies. And when people wanted to watch our movies, they were very much interested in the those movies, and at the same time, there was a, a poor class. However, all classes went to the cinema and uh, watched the movie, and they tasted that move, that type of art. Why don't we taste today that type of art? I think that the type of movies we have today is boosting negativity, starting with this beautiful moving and deteriorating. I don't want to say deteriorating, but uh, but reaching this uh, this level, I think, is uh, destroying our picture or our image in the whole world. No, not necessarily. Um, we have many very successful uh, movies. Movies. Uh, I think that we used. Uh, I think that the majority of people uh, liked Ismail Yassin movies, and it didn't have that deep uh, ideas. It uh, it had clean places, very simple places, but clean. We had designs, uh, locally designed uh, clothes, and this was the nature of the country. But. Unfortunately, many movies are uh, uh, leaking from that filter. When the movies and when the cinema was flourished, I think that the state or the government introduced at that time when the government produced the movies, it uh, produced a very prestigious and important movies. For example, Shay Min Al Khouf movie or uh, a kind of fear movie that's a, a transliteration was was produced by the government. When the government is aware of the value of this industry and is working at several levels, industry, artistic, and commercial, then it would be OK. Because in this case, you would have a government that is supporting your work and is supporting your type of move movies that would go to a festival and be presented there. That's, then in this way, we would have a kind of package, uh, all types of move, move, uh, movies, uh, the commercial ones, uh, the artistic ones, uh, the simple ones. In this way, we would have a package of movies of uh, different uh, types that is not dominated by any culture. Speaking about uh, songs, uh, I think we have the same uh, same struggle. What does a commercial song mean? A commercial song would have a certain mold that we need to get in. And this is the type of song that would succeed. Sometimes we are told, OK, this song will not be successful. Why? Uh, music. Music d uh, doesn't have any kind of laws. We don't have to be under this under umbrella. So I think that we, as, a, a, as people, and the effect of the Egyptian song of people is being is different now. And we have different grades. But still, there is a kind of mold that we need to squeeze in, or squeeze our art in. Where are the songs that I can hear or can, that can change an idea or teach me something or 
uh, make us see things that we never thought of in our normal life. These types uh, of movies uh, that helped us to see certain topics or to know about different certain topics, to know the negative and the positive aspects of a certain topic, to learn from the hero of a certain movie. I think the same thing applies to the songs. Some songs might affect me right now. Maybe th this effect is temporarily not like a movie, of course, because some movies can change people forever. But uh, the songs can encourage me for a certain time, can uh, make me sad uh, if it's uh, a tragedy. So songs, uh, uh, like any other art, they can be a way out to escape, to flee. Uh, it, it's a way out for all people. So people, when they return to their houses, uh, they want to listen to nice songs uh, or watch nice movies that would uh, help us, help them uh, to be, to forget uh, everything that happened to them uh, to, uh, through the whole day. I don't want uh, to be negative, but I feel that uh, the majority of movies that are being presented now are not encouraging. Uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, if I want to see what is Egypt about, I need to see or watch what Egypt presents and what Egypt does to encourage and develop its people. So we need to present these uh, positive uh, aspects. We have good people. We have those beautiful people, those beautiful people that Mrs. Saad Yunus is presenting in her program. They are still there, but we need to see them. We need to remove the dust from all over them. We need to see more positive aspects in our arts. We need to... Um, clarify or um, highlight uh, Egypt uh, in a better way. We need to attract, in order to attract uh, more tourists, we need to encourage people who left Egypt to return and bring the good things with them to Egypt. I think that Egypt deserves this. So, because we are, have a short of time and we have a lot of questions for uh, Mrs. Aad Yunus, and of course we are going to ask you these questions, but there are other t main points we'd like to ask about. So, my question is to Mohammed Bou Abdullah, Mr. Mohammed. We always hear about the soft power. Um, if um, uh, if you can explain it, uh, Timsi, and if you can tell us about um, how how do you use it to face uh, anything extreme, to face wars, to, to face uh, terrorism, and if you can actually back it up or use what was happening in in France, for example. Um, soft power is a um, concept of uh, international relations that was. Uh, created by um, an American professor, Joseph Nye. And uh, basically, uh, in international relations, um, uh, when you are a country, you try to change the behavior of the other country you are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And to change this behavior, you have um, uh, what Joseph Nye says, you have uh, two ways. The first way is the hard way, the hard power, and the other way is the soft power. Hard power is I will change your behavior by using a uh, constraint. So either war or sanctions or whatever. I will threaten you, etc. That's hard power. And soft power is that you will change your behavior because you will willingly do it, because you will believe it is in your interest, because you will believe that you want to do it to be nice with me, etc. But you are not constrained. You do it willingly. So that's <coughs> soft power. It's the capacity for a country to make the other countries change the behavior because they believe it, they should do it because of... Uh, and so soft power, you can do it through culture, language, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So for example, if uh, we have one example between France and Egypt, uh, there is a very strong relationship between France and Egypt, and, and there is a, a mutual soft power relation 
because uh, when uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, when uh, we discovered Egyptology, so there was a, there was a massive impact in France and in Europe, and because of uh, this uh, art and culture that was accumulated in Egypt for thousands of years, so now in France and in Europe, you have people who believe that Egypt is a wonderful country that you should uh, have a strong relationship with Egypt and. Every time and then, we, we, we believe that. And on the other way around, um, because uh, we, France, for two, 200 years, we developed a lot of uh, French-speaking programs, French schools, etc., etc. So we have a lot of uh, people speaking French in Egypt, and we have a lot of people who are naturally friends of France and who are willing mm -hmm. to change the behavior with France. So that's this kind of... Uh, so that's what about soft power? I hope I have been clear. In a nutshell. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Um, how do you think, and uh, this is uh, to you, Rosario, how do you think we can teach younger people and uh, kids and the younger generations to actually love art, to, to, regardless of what kind of art it is, and, 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 and ha have them kind of just hate, hate, hate uh, to have any extreme... Uh, thinking or hate wars, how do you think you can instill that in kids from the beginning? How do you think you can get them to love art in that way and express themselves in a positive way? I think kids automatically naturally love art. It's their first expression. And, you know, and the that's younger how generations, we learn. of course. And mm -hmm. the younger generations, of course, like kids and, and onwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 um, but it's, it's, it's making sure that that's something that, as adults, that we also hold dear. You know, one of the things that's growing so much in the States is STEM programs, getting into science and technology and engineering and maths. And that's very really important. And there's a lot of people who continue to push back on that and say it's not just STEM, it's STEAM. And make sure that arts are a huge part of that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that happens oftentimes when we're going to war or we're in strife, the first programs that are cut are arts because it's considered not as important. But they're critically important for brain development, for connection, for um, being able to problem solve, um, being, having expression, as you said, to get that rage out, but also to, to kind of create those different pathways in the brain so that you have a reaction, but they can actually really shorten the reaction time because it helps you to um, figure out ways to, uh, to redirect you know, so it's as you talked about music and the importance of the value of um, uh, Nesma. You were talking about the importance and value of beauty and positivity. You know, how often I could say, as a cure to depression or anger, just being able to dance and listening to something that was upbeat and happy, watching certain movies that, you know, watching a comedy that just makes you laugh can really just completely change your energy. So really making sure that we're putting that as a vital, important part of a, of a universal need for humans, just as much as you were saying before of, you know, water, food, all these different things are needs, but also companionship and friendship and peace and space and creativity and self-expression and autonomy and having people be able to create and it's not a yes or no answer it's not a you win you lose you know creativity and art is just about expression you can't get it wrong you know you can always just keep playing with it and enjoying it and recognizing you know yeah there are negatives you know so when i'm in the congo or sierra leone you know i'm being told from everyone in the States, oh, be so careful, you're going to Africa. But when I get to Sierra Leone, they're going, you're from New York? Oh, I heard it's so dangerous over there. <laughs> My uncle was a cab driver and he got shot, you know? So it's like, you know, the gangster films I see from over there, does everybody have a gun, you know? So like, yeah, there, there, there are all of these stereotypes that are often propagated, but what's so beautiful about it is that it starts that dialogue. You have all different kinds of people who sit down young and old to watch these movies and they like them or dislike them, you know? And because they like or dislike them, it starts a dialogue about subjects sometimes that might be completely untouchable around war, around politics, around these different things. And it gives people a safe space, as you said, to sort of enjoy um, an opportunity to really express themselves and challenge their way of thinking. Um, but I think a, a big part of it is also recognizing the fact that there is propaganda. 
that so often when we do see our art or we do use our art, it's used in a way from, from Nazi films to um, now when you look at the news, you talk about the media. You know, my cousin worked for um, a, tele a television channel in the States and her job was to collect the footage from, you know, the Afga Afghanistan war and cut it down, you know, hours and hours and weeks of footage down to a three minute segment. And if you watched it, you would think, okay, this soldier just went in and saved these, this child. But when you watched it on Spanish television, you saw that exact same shoulder blow up the house and then go in and save the orphan because mm. he just killed everyone else in the family. Mm. So it was really interesting to see how information is not universally given. And it's, um, it is really important that when we are showing and having people have access to art, that we're also giving the history of it and recognizing how it can be utilized to change hearts and minds. And sometimes you hope in the positive way of using that soft power to really create connections and cultural dialogues, but also to manipulate and to abuse and to, and to gaslight people and to, and to accepting things that they might not otherwise accept, you know, because you're watching these different films and you're becoming desensitized to violence and you're becoming desensitized to some of the issues that are around you and you walk out and you go, wow, that was terrible. I didn't know that about prisons. I didn't know that about women's rights and issues. But then we throw something, you throw a commercial on it and people forget and they move on. And what you've just done is actually breed a sort of intolerance because now people are not so interested in being active anymore because the part that felt like they needed to do something was finished just because they watched that movie. Well, I saw it and I liked it online, so that's enough. And the action behind it isn't mm. there. And that's why I do think it's vitally important to show how important art is, but also in the making of it, going to theaters, the going to galleries, to seeing the physical process behind it, um, and uh, I just wanted to make sure I said everything. Yeah, the, the, yeah, just the, the, the actual opportunity that shows the universality, the reason, you know, when you have um, to this moment now, we know so much about ourselves because of our art, because mm -hmm. of our storytelling. Um, and to capture that is really vitally important and to recognize that, you know, as we are becoming a more homogenous world, that and we're losing our language and we're losing so many different cultures that it is that it that sometimes that's part of the it's the collateral damage of moving into a new era and moving into a new time you know we're not going to continue to use typewriters and floppy disks mm -hmm. like some things are going to go but that it is vitally important to save it just for future generations or to just to understand that diversity and I think that's mm. what art is really critically important for is because it shows our diversity as a species on this planet and how all of us have used this as a means of expressing ourselves. And even if it is just to capture that diversity so that we have a film that still has a language that is now dead, that is just so vitally important because, mm. you know, I think, um, Isad, as you were talking about, you know, it's, it's, you know, putting out, you're putting out so much different kinds of information, but that information is only as good as actually reading that book, mm -hmm. actually watching that movie, actually watching that TV show. So if we continue to show how vitally important it is for the makeup of everything, from our, our self-development to our capacity to see what our future could be and what we could be creating and exploring, if we make art be a consistent and comp, um, part of our dialogue and understanding from the hieroglyphics to the pyramids. It's not just about tourism. It's about what we are capable of as human beings. Mm -hmm. And that bonds us across culture. And when we start recognizing art as, as vitally important as food and water, then I think we'll be able to really respect it and respect the people who make it. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, uh, we would like to talk about uh, um, boosting um, and building art and literature capacity. How, uh, in your point of view, the state can cooperate with uh, the film industry in order to create new ideas and uh, to outreach people and to sensitize them um, uh, um, in the way of the art and in order to have a, a community which uh, uh, hates conflicts and the terrorism. Um, I think now the most important part to mention is how we can incorporate all that we talked about now in our educational system. 
because the future generation um, and me and people here as um, youth, I think we have a, a huge role to play in regards to um, give much more importance to what has been marginalized for many, many years. Um, I couldn't agree more um, with Ms. Saad Yunus about uh, the marginalization of arts. Like um, in a lot of governments around the world, the arts is always considered as um, something that is kind of optional. Um, in schools, a lot of schools around the world have, um, like, do not even get offered uh, art classes, and they kind of direct the children into a system that is like, okay, you're either going to be a scientific person, or you're going to be, um, let's say, a literature person. Yeah. Um, so there is nothing, like, that offers the, 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 the children the opportunity to dream. And in many societies, um, parents kind of grow this insecurity in children and tell them, like, you know, art is not a job. Maybe you can have it as a hobby, but you don't have oh. to think about it mm. as a career. Mm -hmm. And we grow up this insecurity in people, and we don't, do not even give our children, like, the opportunity to dream about something um, non-materialistic, um, because it's always considered as a hobby. But um, what I want to argue about, and um, my recommendation here will be that give me a society that invests in arts, I can assure you that we're going to have the same society that has a lower rate of crime, of terrorism, of um, unemployment, of people insecure and getting into fanatism and extremism. And I think nowadays, we really need to um, uh, stand in front of our governments and um, uh, talk about these fundings that has to be just, as you said, about food and water, to invest more in cultural projects, about artistic projects, because um, in Europe, for instance, um, even young children and young students get the opportunities to um, exchange with other countries. Yes. Um, in my case, like, what I really appreciate in Tunisia, for example, is that there is a lot of artists that took the initiative to go inside the countries to uh, less developed cities and offer performances for free. Um, a lot of people um, didn't even, uh, like, they, they, they had to rely on themselves without even any government support. And um, I think we need to um, worldwide spread out the word that arts is the key to fight terrorism. And um, I also wanted to say that this um, conference slogan is we need to talk, but I think we also need to listen to what our children have to say, to what our children want to do, to what we as youth also want to do, what we need to say. And this is the only opportunity to give the people a way to express themselves and to share their stories and to learn from them. And um, I just want to say that our roles as future parents is to just support our children, to just support them whatever they decide to do, because we're not there to go to redirect them and to influence their um, decisions. And um, I think that the civil society is nowadays more and more aware that art has the biggest role in creating awareness around the world. Mm -hmm. That is the language that unites us all around one single goal, is especially about peace. And I think this is what the summit is about. And we need to talk. Yes, we do. Thank you. I just want to add one, I want to add something. Um, sure. I just want to say, you know, in the States, this past election that happens, a lot of people talked about it, it was at our first meme election. Okay. Um, and, you know, you really just using small little comedy, usually comedic, satirical, often dark, um, you know, just sort of images with a, a line or two. 
And so, you know, the conversation around art being important, I think if, if, if you're missing how significant that is, then you're really not seeing just how important art actually is. You know, Elon Musk says that he wants to, in 10 years, be able to make it so that we can send photos to each other's brains. So we no longer have to actually text it to each other or email it to each other. I can go, hey, did you see that YouTube video? <laughs> no, no. Hilarious, right? <laughs> so, you know, we're seeing now, like, you know, I, I keep bringing up hieroglyphics, but it's, it's so important because the emoji has become like the hieroglyphic. People are speaking in emojis. They're not writing words down anymore. They're not even talking to each other. They're sending each other a smiley face or a sad face. They're sending each other a meme. And that is so important to recognize because in it can be that beautiful thing of connection where, you know, a, a song that's about heartbreak or upset can connect me when I actually feel heartbreak and I can recognize, wow, for generations people have been writing around about heartbreak. That connects me to the rest of humanity in a way that I didn't feel connected before. So if someone wrote that song so perfectly for me, that meant they must have felt that now I feel closer to them. But if you don't have this dialogue truly about how significant art is and you're not really talking to kids and having them develop the capacity for real critical thinking, then that, those memes and those pictures and that shorthand, as you said, because you can't shorthand it. We really, it takes long work, it takes long conversations, it takes real connection and communication and actual real development mm -hmm. of relationship. And when we're just doing this shorthand, there's a lot that's lost in the meanwhile. So if we are not being careful about what it is that we're showing our kids and, and we're not taking it seriously, these memes and all this other stuff, we're going to lose out on a major shift in our culture. That's a, this is our global shift mm -hmm. that is going to our very shorthand around art and utilizing art to communicate. And oftentimes, too oftentimes, it's done without the critical thinking. So... Hopefully we will really understand how critically important art is so that we can start developing people's capacity to go, okay, what do you see here? Mm -hmm. Yes, you got the joke. Yeah, you got some of the meanness, but what else? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes it's funny because it's true. And we need to start really understanding and our capacity for understanding those truths. All right. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Agreed. <laughs> Let's move uh, to the activation of uh, the uh, activation of the cultural role. How can we educate uh, children at schools to love culture better and to hate violence? And do you think that there is difference? Um, we used it during the drawing lessons, which was uh, uh, scored in the end in the final exams. We used to have uh, some uh, handicrafts and we used to have a drama, songs, hymns, poems, telling. And uh, uh, in the end of the year, we were preparing for the show and we shared the competitions and we actually had physical and tangible artistic life. We used to talk to each other other we used to have a challenge to show our skills and uh, and in the morning we used to have a complete show not just saying slogans and ideas uh, uh, and uh, like a duty to do no we were exposing our talents and the talented boy used to go to the headmaster uh, or headmistress and they tell him or tell her that he would like to uh, show um, uh, cast something we have witnessed everything. We have visited all museums in Egypt. And our first uh, visit was uh, to the Wax uh, Museum, uh, to the Police Museum, which uh, comprises uh, photos for uh, serial killers, which turned into... Uh, which actually turned into a movie called Alessio al Kilab or uh, The Thief and the Dogs. Uh, I read the novel uh, written by Nagi Mahfouz. I watched the movie. All these things motivated me to re to make research and to to love what I'm doing. Now, 
uh, it's very busy life and the children are very busy with their curriculum and the second thing I would like someone to, to answer me uh, like Dr. Ahlam the head of the uh, art academy and I have a good relation with her uh, she might respond to this question and tell us how can we teach such kinds kinds of arts to uh, children at school because she is the only uh, one who has an academy academy that can be t uh, taught we are the only uh, uh, country in the world that have such a kind of academy that can uh, grant uh, a master or a, a PhD degree and we can outreach other schools and we can um, f form and develop other curriculums in Africa or in Egypt and we can have other branches in other countries in Africa with our experts with our, with our artists and the professors who can teach these people. We are the only uh, academy which gives honorary PhD to significant people who we'd like to make good relation with. <coughs> all these answers can, can, all these questions can be answered by the uh, president of the Art Academy. I just have a question to um, some of the people. I have just watched a movie or a video for Tembe Bashki, a 17-year-old boy, an Indian boy who lives in Canada, and he developed uh, uh, softwares since he was uh, uh, seven years old. Now he is working on Watson for IT technology. Uh, artificial technology uh, programs. He uh, gives the seminars and the speeches, and uh, I, I, my attention was dragged to the uh, uh, fact that he he wasn't uh, in any enrolled in any schools. He uh, used to to learn at home. He has a home education. His father was keen on giving him home or domestic education. I don't know whether this is a, a new kind. Uh, or method uh, of teaching or uh, uh, or something because we can apply it here in Egypt uh, for people who are who are uh, uh, prevented from having such a kind uh, of formal uh, education and I have heard about Khalid al is the son uh, who is studying uh, computer and things like this and he discovered something wrong with Windows 8. He sent it to Microsoft, and Microsoft uh, believed that this uh, child is a genius, and they kept on uh, paying for his education uh, fees, and Khalid al-Khamisi can tell us this story. All these models can be uh, witnessed, and we can have uh, conclusions from all these experiments. And as for the question of the arts, uh, I think that the, the head of the Academy of the Arts can tell us about this. We can also ask people from the profession, and we talk with our guests. We would like to have a mic for uh, uh, the president of the Art Academy to talk with us about this. Uh, first of all, good evening. Uh, I would like to pre pre represent ourselves. We are the, from the Academy of Arts, which has been established. It was established in 1962, uh, um, uh, or even uh, 32, because it is the, the 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 leading academy, which includes all performing arts, cinema, the theater, uh, music, uh, conservatoire, or Arab music. Uh, Ballet, um, uh, criticism, or uh, oriental um, arts. We are doing what you were uh, proposing. Uh, we have uh, been trying to uh, develop curriculums in uh, schools. We go to schools uh, not only to tell them to learn uh, music or art, but we go to such schools. We uh, 
give them advices and some of the, for example, the musicians uh, sit uh, among uh, the children who has never witnessed the flute, for, exa for example, and uh, they try the flute and uh, they try to play the flute. Since then, uh, they became to love uh, the flute and uh, the sound of music. So um, uh, concerning education, we have to work from uh, the primary stage or the kindergarten stage because uh, um, if you are uh, working on the sensitivity and the feelings of the very young people, you can start from the basics. And uh, some other people will continue the experiments which we are uh, trying to do nowadays. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Because of short of time and we are about to finish our uh, session, we only have 20 minutes to go. We still have some uh, uh, questions to answer. I have the questions and uh, the one I am going to uh, say his name. Uh, please uh, present yourself and ask your question to the uh, panel. Marina Al-Masri, please. Good evening, Gerejo Heads, Egypt. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, headed, is headed to Isad Yunis. Each Ramadan, we have the same question, we have the same issue. Do we ha uh, do, do all the drama of Ramadan uh, uh, should talk about the street and the problems uh, uh, we have on the ground? Don't we? Uh, isn't it the time to have? Uh, uh, some other kinds of, uh, of uh, drama uh, to oppose the problem of the action or the gangs in the street and uh, to present them and to show them uh, on uh, Ramadan drama is wrong or is it uh, or do we have any other ways to present such a kind of drama? Whatever uh, problem, uh, um, like uh, narcotic abuses or dealing or like uh, mobs uh, or uh, gangs in the streets, we always have this question. Is it uh, possible to, ta to tackle these issues in uh, another way? Yes, one of the critics talked about this, and he said that I'm going to have a movie uh, who uh, the hero is going um, uh, to be very polite uh, and his wife is going to be very decent and uh, their children are going to be very, very polite. They are kissing their hands and they, uh, in the evening they are studying the work and they, uh, at night they sleep uh, and that's it. So uh, we we told him, okay, do this. We are a community rich of many kinds of drama. Brazil, uh, uh, like in Brazil and uh, any other countries like us are very rich in drama. I would like to ask someone, how can we deal with uh, having such a, a huge production of drama without tackling all kinds of, uh, of issues and the problems? Uh, while we were in Switzerland, we were uh, walking by the lake and we wanted to go to the uh, fair uh, uh, the theme park uh, and uh, a very elderly uh, woman was walking beside us with, uh, with a mask face and she was very uh, disciplined. She is taking her breast uh, very uh, regularly and uh, I, my attention was dragged to her. She was walking with us in the street. We reached the mountain and uh, there was a telefreak. She sat in the telefreak and uh, the children were making a fuss and the noise and I was watching her and then the kids started to uh, play and then she sat, she asked for her dinner, uh, the, um, the waiter uh, knew what she would like to eat and then she started to contemplate and uh, then she went down with us in the telefreak until she disappeared. This kind of a person or a human being is not happy or he is not vital. He is not uh, interacting with people. She lives a very in very peace 
uh, peaceful life, and you cannot ju uh, judge her by doing this. So the drama we are uh, producing is 10% of the reality. Yes, I know that, but there are no limits and there are no restrictions about this kind of production, of drama production, because this is not the real fact or the real uh, world which we live in. And it, all the drama should not be applicable to the reality. We cannot be uh, unjust to uh, everyone. Uh, the number of uh, the drama production is uh, decreasing. And uh, some other dramas are uh, dealing with novels. Um, last year we had Wahat uh, al uh, and Wanus and some other uh, drama like Afrah al Obba written by Nagim Mahfouz. And, uh, also, the drama which is written in novels are actually from the real uh, life. He, so you have a 30 uh, episode uh, drama uh, uh, with the same uh, drama produced at the same time. So we should have uh, uh, diversification because also our drama should be produced at the, at the same time in Ramadan because this is uh, the peak season and uh, the um, advertisements are financing and funding our drama. I'm not sure whether the state is producing anymore or not, but uh, the uh, advertising companies are financing our uh, drama production. So the drama decreased from 76 uh, in the few uh, past years to uh, 46. So we have to compete among each other and to tackle uh, other issues in order to compete. And uh, this is uh, a circumstance. People are not uh, uh, keen on doing this all time, but uh, this is because of the peak season, because of the finance. You cannot create any more uh, drama. You cannot, uh, for example, produce uh, novels like Al Ayam uh, for uh, Tahsin. Uh, so you have to find things which are very uh, interactive, uh, full of action, uh, uh, and maybe you find things which which you would like to produce and that the sponsor doesn't approve about. Um, we have some sponsored instructions. So uh, what are the solutions from your point of view? We are trying certain things in our community and we are trying to find the pros and cons and to find out which kind of solution we are going to apply. Some of the drama are going to be, for example, presented in the uh, or showed in the morning and some others in the afternoon. So you cannot apply certain rules now because we are in a, uh, in, um, a case of instability uh, in terms of finance, the state is not financing or producing any uh, drama like Al Haggan, Al Filila Ulela, uh, and many other famous drama uh, productions which were distributed uh, worldwide. So you cannot judge them. I can just second and praise the drama which was very good for Wahid Al Group, for example. I can say you are number one. Thank you. There is a question from Kushbu from India. Uh, my name is Kushbu and I'm from India. And actually everyone touched the topic of this negative media, like the stereotypes created. And everyone touched, as she said, like Rosario, dear Rosario said that we, when created, the stereotypes are created, we actually start the dialogue about that, oh, this thing is happening, what about this and that. I want to talk about the social media, which are actually, there's lots of information, overwhelming amount of information our youth have. We have YouTube videos, we have Facebook, and everyone is pouring down their opinion without having uh, the wholesome picture. What do you think about that? What are the tools our youth have in the, this era of social information and YouTube to, correct, to choose the right kind of information and to choose the right kind of, not to fall in the category of creating stereotypes? So Your and, question is to... to, to, to may, yes, okay. yes. Like, what do you think like, about YouTube and stuff? Uh, 
once more I want to uh, talk about something. Uh, this technolo technological advancement uh, that uh, happened all over the world was received by the Egyptian uh, people or citizens uh, without even reading their catalogs. Yes, the Egyptian citizens and the Egyptian people uh, accepted and absorbed this technological advancement uh, very quickly. We are looking for hot news uh, and uh, we don't have any manager or controller uh, to know who's right and who's, r who's wrong. I think that uh, uh, the best solution for this is to have uh, formal to have formal uh, pages. Uh, uh, for example, we were brought up uh, to have the official newspaper, and we knew that everything written in that newspaper was correct. So the problem here is that people are lying on these social media uh, sites. Also, also, we have uh, something like an open buffet. Every In the past, we used to have several platforms without people uh, saying their opinions. But However, now we have like um, millions of uh, platforms, millions of uh, websites uh, for people to talk from and uh, have others to like what they say. It's just like an open buffet to it's just the same as as uh, people like you being locked in this room and then you say all of a sudden the buffet has started and everyone would be running for the buffet. I think that uh, our awareness is not equal to the conception. It should be uh, governed by laws. Uh, we should have a penalty uh, applicable on those who uh, might perform anything or might violate the rules, uh, even if we want to express things freely. You can have the freedom of speech. When I say control, control is not like censorship. Uh, we still have problems. I know that everyone expressing his opinion is sometimes looked down at because they are just this uh, difference. However, there is a difference between the freedom of expression and freedom of creativity. We need to have some characteristics and features for this freedom. For example, in the USA, you can express you uh, can say you can express your opinion, but you cannot like uh, uh, characterize something uh, uh, like a, a Negro person and say he's black. This is wrong. If I write, for example, up an article, if I said that uh, Sad Yunus uh, is dead, has passed away, you know, I I died like thousands times. If we don't penalize those people, if we don't don't close the accounts of such people if they commit such mistakes. We won't be able to control role, uh, the, uh, for example, the idea of revenge. Uh, we have some people who are revenging, thinking that they are bold. No, it's not the freedom of expression. It's about uh, um, scolding people. You had spoken about that earlier as well, about the piracy and people watching things um, illegally. And that's kind of the issue with the Internet is that, you know, there is no um, laws that are in place to keep people's property. So you can go on YouTube and watch full movies and all of these different things. And the onus is on the artist to try to take things down. So it's actually hurt a lot of artists in music and in film and stuff because they can't make money anymore off of stuff because someone else is making money off of being able to just get clicks. Um, but I just wanted to add to just talking about social media and the safety of it. You know, my, a friend of mine, um, Jim Steyer wrote a book called Talking Back to Facebook, 
and he specifically was talking about how much screen time should be allowed for kids, and he goes through the different ages. And I just thought that was really important because you have parents who are putting television screens in their infant's room, and they're letting kids kind of grow up in front of the television, and it really talks about how the brain doesn't develop properly because we need to have three-dimensional learning and actual physical touch and different things, um, and talking about how that gets older and the safeties around it, because there's stuff called sexting, and there's stuff called sextortion, and all of the different things that are going on online where people are reaching out to each other, and they're using Google Earth to look into their homes and go, if you don't do this right now and send me a video of it, I'm going to come up your red staircase and come and get you. And they're halfway across the planet. And so, you know, the internet and social media is this neighborhood, this alleyway that we're allowing our kids to just walk down without any sort of rules around which way to look both ways and, you know, who not to speak to. You know, people are saying where they're at, their actual location. It takes three minutes to look up full information on someone, where they go to school, who their best friends are, what their interests are, and it makes it really easy for people to be manipulated and to be abused. And they're using that through social media, through, you know, using videos, using, you know, games and things that connect people to each other and then finding other subversive ways to you know mislead or manipulate people so I think a, you know a big part of it is kind of the generation gap and that you have young people who are you know on their cell phones and just going oh P POS and that means parent over shoulder and like they're having this dialogue that they're having between each other and that's really beautiful to see kids talking to each other but they're doing it in without any wisdom and that wisdom needs to be passed down and it can't just be adults just going, oh, that's bad or shut that off or I don't understand how to use this phone. Like there really needs to be a really strong dialogue and communication around brain development, around art, around critical thinking, around you know, um, actual ownership of art and all of these things. It, it just needs to be bigger and longer dialogues. More like this is a real, actually a really big question as we're moving forward because that is the future of communication is social media. All right. Well, thank you, Rosario. Uh, Mr. Mohammed, you wanted you have something to say as well, right? Yeah, I think that the last two questions were uh, connected, in fact, because um, th the problem is today is that you um, uh, there is a problem of supply. We have the supply of social media, which is massive, and you have the problem of this uh, drama of Ramadan, uh, which are only one-sided with one topic, etc. So the, the question is to us is how to create space. For, diff for alternatives, for different supplies. And uh, I see that we need public funding. And uh, we have this problem in France today, and I guess that we have this problem in Egypt as well. So how do you uh, increase the, the, the financing by the public sector directed to arts? It's extremely important. In France, we have this goal that 1% of the state budget should be directed to arts and culture all over the country. And uh, we are not yet that. Uh, we are not yet there, but we are hoping to, to go there. And I think it's very important that we, uh, we preserve some part of the arts and culture from the economic interests, be it uh, the TV shows or uh, the social media companies. So that's very important. Second, we need not to concentrate this public spending on the capital. In France, we had this problem. Everything was going to Paris, the big capital for ages. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to... Uh, bring money to different parts of France and to, to give it to, uh, to uh, artistic directors and they are free to do whatever they want okay. with that. So no control by the government. It's up to them to create a theater, to create a scene and to, um, to spend this money for artists. Not only for the building, mm -hmm. because that's easy, the building, but for uh, uh, concerts, for theater, etc. And so you have... Um, an alternative, a different supply, uh, which is uh, we can compete to social media and TV. And that's very important that we keep on doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, I wanted to uh, say something with regard to the social media. 
maybe this has to do uh, with the importance to the importance uh, to all types of activities in the life of children. These types of activities are consuming the time of a child, however healthily, so that uh, instead of sitting in front of their fa Facebook and cell phones, uh, they would do activities. I think it's contagious. I think. Uh, the art uh, being presented uh, and the lack or uh, or the absence of uh, activities in their life uh, makes us makes them uh, interpret things wrongly sometimes they write uh, status on the facebook uh, that are far beyond their age sometimes they listen to songs uh, that they do not understand and they take one sentence from their uh, this song and just uh, uh, upload it in a way or another. For example, uh, uh, a, um, um, a lady or a, a girl uh, who is 15 years old, uh, only 15 years old, is saying, is talking about heartbreaking and love. And you keep asking yourself, how did you know that? You, do, you know nothing about this. When they say, when they talk about men and when they talk about relationships, they have no idea uh, about uh, this type of topic. They have no background. They have never lived it. They they uh, don't have what are the results of what they are saying on them personally. So we can say once more that uh, children need uh, things to consume their life, consume their time. They, they need something. It's not uh, a good idea to, uh, to, ha to give... Uh, to give a video game or to to give a tablet as a present to their children for all parents it's not an ad it's not advisable to give presents in the form of video games or uh, pad ipads or so they need to be more communicating with people around them we cannot be uh, seeing two people sitting together and they text each other i there is no kind of uh, communication. People are becoming introverts. They say everything they want to say. They dream to say with the em emojis, uh, with texting. It's not about connectivity anymore. I wish that... Uh, we uh, are able uh, to uh, uh, include art uh, in the life of children. I think that uh, the previous generation is over, but at least we need to make sure that the coming generation, uh, coming generation would uh, be more uh, responsive or uh, positively responsive to uh, such activities. I need parents to be more decisive in this also. I want to comment on this uh, saying that 40% of our uh, population is under 15. We have a lot of children, in fact, uh, in our people. And those children do not watch TV. They do not go to the theater. They deal only with the social media. So um, I think that the danger of uh, tablet is coming. Uh, Unfortunately, we are not uh, present. Uh, they watch the screen of their tablets or computers. Uh, they don't watch TV, as I told you. Thanks uh, in Sahbet Saad uh, that we are able uh, to uh, collect the family, to make the family gather. So I want to talk to the government. Uh, this uh, big uh, investment in uh, TV programs uh, will be absent after 10 years. So please, we don't have uh, a, fi a good feasibility for the programs uh, uh, produced on TV, and we are not on the social media. We need uh, to penetrate uh, that field uh, so that uh, we have something like the YouTube Kids. Uh, the YouTube Kids uh, is being uh, used by children and the data provided uh, by the YouTube Kids uh, is correct. Uh, I speak about my grand 
daughter who's two years. I don't have a YouTube kids in Arabic. I don't have an Arabic cartoon, a correct Arabic cartoon. And I don't think that it's going to be there after five years. I don't think she will be watching a series of 30. Uh, they would scroll uh, the series. I don't know. This is the future. We need to be alert to this. Uh, this is a field that we need to invade because it has become the reality. Thank you, speakers. Uh, hopefully that you enjoyed uh, what we said. Unfortunately, our time uh, finished. Uh, thank you so much and thank you everyone.